All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for a virtual lunchtime lecture from the, the New Bedford Whaling National Historic Park. Uh, the name of today's presentation, um, well, the one that I'm going with, uh, Rufai, is Stories from the Whaling Port. All and right. so we're going to discover the origins and historical significance of New Bedford's Whaling Port. And this uh, program is led by National Park Guide Rufai Shardo. So all, let's see, where are we at? All nearly 200 of us. Let's give a big virtual round of applause to Rufai for joining us this afternoon. And Rufai, you can take it away. Thanks so all much. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And also, Robert, thank you for this introduction. And thank you, or each one of you, or those who joined me, thank you so much for this program. And I see all, everywhere, it's come from everybody, uh, from all the towns, that's great. Uh, again, uh, and as you know, the stories about stories for New Pop, New uh, stories for New Bedford. But stories for New Bedford, we can spend all day just talking about the stories for New Bedford. So I'm just going to focus on the economic and cultural transformation of New Bedford. And again, my name is Ranger Rufai Shadow. I'm also from Fall River, Massachusetts. So thank you. You can see some information. If you want to get more information about the park, this is our website. Uh, www.gov forward slash need. You can see all our upcoming programs, especially summer programs. So again, thank you. All right. So we're going to start. Let me save my. All right. So before I, before I go on, I always like to acknowledge uh, the indigenous people. So where I'm coming from you, Dartmouth, New Bedford, Westport, Fall River, used to be occupied or owned by the indigenous people. This is their land before the Europeans, before the African-Americans, before everybody else came in. So, and then from New Bedford, especially we have people from the Aquina or the Gayhead. We have the Mashpee who live in Cape Cod. We have the Erin Pond, the Pocanet, the Pocasset. These are just few of the tribes that live around here you know, again, before everybody else. And so my next question to you in the chat box, who are some of the indigenous people, right, who lived where you, where you are coming from right now? So if you don't mind sharing in your chat, which name some of the indigenous people that live around you? Or Nipmuc, the Wampunwak, awesome. The Pawtucket, I got one, yes, yes, yes. Mostly Wampunwak, that's great. New bed for the up. Pawtucket, well, yes. So these are just, there's a lot of tribes that live here again before everybody else again. And thank you so much uh, for the answers. So New Bedford, the map you are looking right now is the historical district. The green is the boundary of the National Park Service. New Bedford became a national park in 1996. And the focus of the national park is to share the stories of New Bedford whaling. But with whaling came all kinds of story. New Bedford, we have the Underground Railroad, runaway and slave, call it New Bedford, they are, they are home. We have the stories of the Irish, the Scottish. We have all this story that we share, the architecture, we have the buildings, banks. So all these are stories that we share. In the, in the National Park Service, also the Whaling Museum the largest whaling museum in the world. In this place, you can see Actifat collection, how the whaling industry all came about. And we also have, if you know about Herman Melville, Moby Dick, the Seaman Bethel, the chapel that he wrote about is in the National Park Service. So as a park ranger, this is what we do. We take people on a walking tour. So hopefully this summer, you can make your way to the National Park Service for a walking tour in the historical district. My next, again, what word or phrase comes to mind when you hear the title of the program, Stories from the Whaling Port of New Bedford? What comes to mind? You don't mind sharing in the chat below. All right. Moby Dick, yes, call me Ishmael. Moby Dick, yep. Dangerous Adventures, Great World, Quakers. Wow, wooden sailing vessels, Portuguese fishermen. These are great answers. And this is why, this is why New Bedford separated itself 
from other towns around, like the like Fairhaven, Westport, Nantucket, where the whaling industry started. So whaling before now, New Bedford started in Nantucket, scalloping. Number New Bedford is what number one fishing port in the country because of what scallop, scrimshaw, scrimshaw are the art made by whalemen during their whaling voyages when they are bored. These are all great answers. Thank you for contributing. So let me give you all. So this is the map that you see right here, are the map of New Bedford. These are some few families that purchased New Bedford, and most of them are shipwrights and boat rights. So that was why New Bedford was mostly into the maritime uh, industry, the whaling scope of whaling. So if you look at this point, you see some place say the barrier point. Before the whaling industry came into New Bedford, the waterfront used to be a barrier point, but eventually always moved out. And then before the whaling industry came in. And this map that you look right here, is not far from what is going on right now in New Bedford. The Azorians, Kivet. Yes, we're going to talk more about the Azorians and Kivets. So again, the Akushnet River that attracted people. One thing about Akushnet River is the deep harbor. The deep harbor separated New Bedford from what? The other whaling ports, all the way from Maine to South Carolina. There were a lot of whaling ports. But New Bedford, the Akushnet, separate east, east, uh, separate itself from other ports. We have Joseph Russell. Joseph Russell was the one who introduced what we call shoreline whaling. So before the dust went, but by, by that time, Nantucket was already whaling. But Nantucket as an island could not expand too many, the sandbars, not enough shorelines, not in the deep harbor was now. So eventually New Bedford whaling and the Nantucket whaling merchants moved portion of their world to what? To New Bedford. And that's how New Bedford became the one of the wealthiest city, not in America, but in the world, per capita income wise. So John Luding was also a boat right. Benjamin Tabor, Joseph Roch was actually the one who brought the whaling from what? New Bedford. He was married to Love Macy in Nantucket. He was what? A shoe cobbler from Riviere. When he came here, eventually in Nantucket, he moved New Bedford and he changed the face of the whaling industry. This is why again, this is why New Bedford is so important. International world class whaling port. We have a deep harbor, abundant shorelines. We have easy access to market, right? So this was separates again New Bedford from Nantucket. And by 1820, 1830, you are looking at New Bedford as the whaling capital of the world. Next PowerPoint. This is a chart of the oceans around the globe. And if you look at the Atlantic Ocean, there are no whales in the Atlantic Ocean because by 1851, literally they've killed all the whales in the Atlantic Ocean. And now they're looking for a new hunting ground. And that became what? The Pacific Ocean. At that time, by 1850 also, the Arctic Ocean was not explored yet. It was, it will come later on. That's, that, that will be the last hunting ground the Arctic Ocean. So when they discovered the Pacific Ocean, New Bedford really merchants moved portion of their world to San Francisco. Also because of what? The railroad was already in, in the picture. So they moved to San Francisco and they were able to establish some business in San Francisco and they have easy access to Pacific Ocean. And also they don't have to go all the way down South America to Chile into the ocean. Now they can just go from San Francisco into what? The Atlantic Ocean. And the whaling voyage was tedious. So as you know, on this, on this map, also you can see some brown spot. These are the islands. Just like someone said, the Azore, the, the Cape Verde. This was island that the whaling merchant or the, the captains would stop and pick up men on the whaling voyages. This Cape Verde, this Azore, when they come back in New Bedford, some will stay, some will go back home. And that's why New Bedford became one of the melting parts in the country. But you're right, Cavedians play a huge role in the whaling industry. Later on will come the African Americans and the Irish and the Portuguese and many other people came to New Bedford. So just to give an, an example of the map, this was drilled in 1851. And by that time, as you can see again, the Arctic Ocean. 
And then when they got to the Arctic Ocean, that was a different whole story. For the Arctic Ocean, they were not ready for the ice, for the cold, the freezing temperature. They were not ready for it. And they lost a lot of lives on the Arctic Ocean. Next PowerPoint presentation. These are some of the products that were, were taken from the wells. We have the baleen, we have the blabber, the skin. The baleen are what we call what? The, the well stooped. So for instance, a, a bowhead well that is found in the Arctic Ocean has 14 feet. 14, that's twice my height, the size of baleen in the map. And this baleen helped what? To sieve their food. Eventually, baleen will be used for corset. Women, one of the, one of the highest faction back then. Then we have the blabber, the layer, the skin. We have the spermacity, or also found only in the sperm well. We have the ambergris. Ambergris is also a product only found in the sperm well, and that was used in perfumes, which is fascinating. Then the whale oil. The whale oil and the spermacity oil are two different oil. It's like comparing a Lamborghini and a Ford. The Ford is the whale oil, and the spermacity oil is the Lamborghini, quality-wise difference. So Lamborghini, the oil from the sperm well is used for candles. The candle lasts longer, does not stink. Uh, it stays, it's very bright. And that's a difference. It was very, very expensive. Then these are, the, these are the type of wells that were hunted. So the blue well and the fin well, these two wells were not much hunted. Why? Because they are too large. They don't have enough oil. And when they are hunted or killed, they sink. The bowhead will, the right will, sperm will, and the humbuck will, they float when they are killed. So their process was much easier. And they also slow, swim very slow. However, the sperm will is the only will that dives deep, very, very deep when it's harpooned. And some of you who have read Moby they call me Ishmael. It was the sperm well that destroyed the excess, right? Or the, the Moby Dick. Because sperm well are very, very dangerous. Some of them call them the carpenter well. Because sometimes they'll be whaling and they'll be hitting some knot at the bottom of their ship. So these are wells that were hunted. Again, but the most prized of all the wells is what? Sperm well. Right here is that's what I mentioned, the Berlin well. These are the Berlins. This is what they use, again, to sieve their food and also use for what? The corset in women's fashion. And this was very, very expensive. So this also contributes to the wealth of the city. Then we have this, the what? Sperm well. Somebody mentioned scripture. This is where the scripture comes from. People use this as art when they are bored during four to five years whaling voyages. When they are bored, this is what they use for scripture. If you happen to come to the Whaling Museum or come check us out, they have a wonderful collection in the Whaling Museum. Fascinating collection. All of them coming, some of them from what? The truth of sperm whales. And this is what I mean by the sperm whale. The head of the sperm whale is what? Separated from the body and put on a dock on the deck of the ship. The spermacity oil and found in the head is scooped out and stored at the bottom of the what? The ship. And this well, this sperm, this oil from sperm well, again, is one of the most prized oil. And the process to process the oil, oil into candles can last up to six months to a year. They have winter press, spring press, summer press, fall press it's to separate the oil what for, for, uh, for to refine the oil and again new bedford before the end of whale in 1925 there was over 40 oil refineries built in new bedford and that's why new bedford also separated itself from other towns these are two existing candle works right now to my far left the rodman candle is in the national park right now the second one, the William A. Robinson, is off of Route 18. And these two buildings are still standing right now to kind of commemorate, to tell you how whaling industry survived in New Bedford, right? The whaling, you can say the Roman Kendall work 
has three floors. The bottom of the basement is where they, they kept the, the, what, the oil. Was is damped to keep the barrels from shrinking. And then they move the oil to the first floor and the third floor as part of the processing. And this is takes, again, almost a year for it. That's why some of the candles are very, very expensive. Then we move on to the fortunes of New Bedford. In the New Bedford history, there's over 19 financial institutions alone in New Bedford, just within a five acre block. 19 banks, financial institutions alone, because New Bedford was what? The wealthiest city in the world, right? Wealthiest city in the world. So by 1845, New Bedford had what? Had over 247 worship out of three, out of 735 worship in the US that were built and sell right here at the waterfront. Right here at the waterfront. Some of you have known the Boston Tea Party. One of the ships, the Dartmouth, was built and sailed right here in New Bedford. The only existing wood ship right now in Mystic, Connecticut, was built and sailed right here in New Bedford. And if you want to see the size of a well ship, of a wooden well ship, take a trip to Mystic, uh, Connecticut. You'll see an example, the Charles W. Morgan. So again, this is the value. And then by, by uh, 1857, you are looking at New Bedford as what? The wealthiest city in the world. By that time, the, the size of the increased ship has increased, right? We have what? 39 whaling vessels coming from New Bedford. 39. Yes, somebody commented. He had a last, the active wooden whale ship in history. Yes, standing right now. So, and then you can see some of the prices. 7.3 million gallons of whale oil was sold at 73 cents per gallon. For spermacity oil was sold at what? $1.28 per gallon. That's in the 1850s. And then if you look at what? The, the total value, 10.5 million. Now it's what? $360 million yearly were coming into New Bedford. That's why New Bedford was so rich. In, and then in 1850, if the money was shared equally among the people living in New Bedford, everybody will have a millionaire. That's how much money was coming to New Bedford. All right. Center Street. Some of you, if you have been to New Bedford, this is Center Street right here. This is the Center Street that connects to the rest of the world. And right here, you can see also the water, Akushnet River, not far from here. And this is where they built, they built and sell wooden ships right here from New Bedford. And it's also here at the Center Street that started what? The shoreline whaling. So before adventuring into the Pacific Ocean, the whalers will go to what? Atlantic Ocean. Hand the whales, tow them to the waterfront right here and process them. This went on for a while until the Atlantic Ocean, with the other whales were killed and then they move on to the Pacific Ocean. And also what happened at the same time, the size of the, of the ships changed. So beginning was a sloop, which was one mast, schooners, two masts. Before the whaling ships, whaling back three to four masts. And these are over 360 tons, and they are huge. Again, that's why New Bedford took over the whaling industry with the size of the ships. So this center, this picture you see right here, is where the whaling industry started. And then they take off into the what? And you can see the blue mark. These are all the, the whaling wharfs, or what they call the slips. And by 1850, also close to 50 of them at the waterfront right here. And that's where the whaling ship will, will anchor and live. At the same time, this was also where what? Runaway and slave will be run into New Bedford. And they'll be what? Safe and protected. That'll be, for, that'll be the next story. Then some, these are some of the jobs at the seaport. We have coopers, we have blacksmiths, we have roof factory, outfitting a ship, wagons. This is all, and this is this, this is very demanding job, very, very demanding. So that's why the Clevedians made call here home, the Azorians, the Irish, the German, 
African Americans. This was for fascinating for them because William Voyage was four to five years, right? So for an African American or an enslaved person in New Bedford, this is the word they need to take to get away from land. And some of them also, before they came to New Bedford, they were skilled blacksmiths, hoopers. So when they came to New Bedford, it was what? Right fit for them to jump in the industry. Some of you already know Louis Temple, a, a, a blacksmith who changed the face of whaling through his invention called the Tagal Harpoon, which we'll talk about briefly on our, our, one of our, our points. All right. And then this is what New Bedford looked like. To my father, you see the oil, the barrels, thousands, thousands. Depending on the size of a ship, some of them carry 500 to 1,000 of them, right? And they make sure each barrel is filled. Sometimes they'll stop at Europe to sell some of them and they go on whaling food and then before they will come home. Blacksmith, that's what, this is, this is a triwet, two large iron parts that was in the ship that were used to process or render the whale oil while on a whaling voyage. Look at the size of the barrel, over almost my size, and they are huge. And again, when they are built in the holding area of the ships, they make sure every kernel, every space is filled. So if it's a small space, maybe two foot by two, guess what? They'll build a bar of the same size and push it in. And then again, they'll make sure everything will be coming on. All right. These are some of the whaling merchants. We have Samuel Rodman, William Roach, and Captain Paul Coffey. Samuel Rodman invested in the what? He has investment in the whaling, the oil, processing the oil into candles. William Roach, the son of what? The great, great son of what? Joseph Roach. He actually changed the face of whaling. His visionary, his invention, his took New Bedford to a whole different level when it came to the whaling voyage. And then we have Captain Paul Coffey. Before I go on, has anybody heard of Captain Paul Coffey? Let me see if somebody have heard of the name Captain Paul Coffey. Anybody? Captain Paul Coffey was born in 18... 1817, he was a Wampanoag, an African American. His father was from Ghana, where I came from. His mom was Ruth Moses. Kaffee became one of the wealthiest, wealthiest individuals to live in America. Wealthiest in during slavery days in America. He became a whaling what? He was a whaling merchant. Most of his crew that he hired with African Americans and indigenous people to give them hope and opportunity. He was the first person to build an integrated school in Westport. By the time we talk about the whaling industry or whaling merchants, for Catholics now mentioned, I like to mention this is a guy who, again, changed, was able to change the face of whaling. And I always ask the question what are his chances if he was born in the South? What are his chances? But Paul Coffey, again, is visionary at the age of 14 when he started whaling voyage. 14. By 24, he was a captain. Before he died in 1817, again, you are looking at an individual who went to the White House to what? To protest against taxation without representation. Paul Coffey. Next stop. This is Lewis Temple. Louis Temple also came for what? Richmond, Virginia. We don't know much about him in terms of whether he was enslaved or not, but he was in New Bedford in 1840s when he came to New Bedford. And he was the one who reinvented the Tagal Harpoon that you see right here, a blacksmith. And this Tagal Harpoon changed the face of whaling. His Tagal Harpoon increased the catch of whales. Again, his Tagal Harpoon it increased the catch of wheels. The sad part of Lewis Temple is, as an African American, as an runaway and slave, as someone who could not read really write, write, did not patent his invention. 
So he, had, so he ended up dying very poor. And there's a whole story about him. But Tagal Hapun, this guy invented. Now we have a statue of him in the public library in New Bedford, not far from here, here where we celebrate and honor the work that he has done by contributing to the whaling uh, uh, industry. So again, 1820, 1840, New Bedford became the face of whaling, again, a banner shoreline. But again, this is again an individual that most people don't know about. It's not in our history book. But it's little piece of work contributed to the whaling industry. Frederick Douglas. I know people always talk about when they see Frederick Douglas, it's mostly about the anti slavery movement. But Frederick Douglas worked right here in New Bedford. Three of his children were born right here in New Bedford. Douglas was born again into slavery in 1818, and he wrote in his journal, I have not met a single slave and a slave who could tell me when he or she was born. So in terms of when he's born, it's very, we don't really know, but we are going with 1818 when he was born. Maryland, when he was born, he met a young lady called Anna Murray, and Anna was the one who helped, who helped Douglas escape what? Slavery. And Douglas in Maryland was a what? A corker. Corker is someone who corks ships, preventing the ship from leaking. That's his job when he was in Maryland. When he escaped Maryland, he was going to Canada. He was advised in New York by the vigilance committee. Douglas, do not go to Canada. Come to where? New Bedford. They are whaling ships, whaling merchants. They are Quakers. Abundant of jobs for you in New Bedford. And in New Bedford, they will make sure not a slave hunter or a slave catcher will come to New Bedford and take you back to slavery. When he left New York, he came to New Bedford. And guess what? 45 years, nobody came looking for him. In New Bedford, he was safe and he was protected. The sad part of New Bedford is he never got to work as a corker because corking was what? Meant for white people. But at least he said to himself, at least I am free. I can work and make a living and what? Take care of my wife and kids. So before he left New Bedford to lead Massachusetts, to Rochester, New York, to Washington, New Bedford gave him, as he said in his own word, my new existence. I was reborn right here in New Bedford. He gave his first speech in 1841 in where? In Nantucket. Keep going on. These are some of few quotes about Douglas. Douglas said, I found employment the third day after arrival in stowing a sloop with a load of oil. It was new, it was dirty, it was hard work for me, but I went at it with a glad heart and a willing hand. I was what? Now my own master. It was a happy moment, the rapture of which was to be entirely my own. There was no master here standing ready the moment I earned the money to rob me of it. I worked that day with a pleasure I had never uh, before experienced. I was at work for myself, newly married wife. It was to me the starting point of a new existence. That's what New Bedford meant to Douglas when he came to New Bedford here, when he came to the city. He said, when I made my first two shillings, when I clapped the money in my hand, my heart swelled because the money belongs to me. And you can see another quote about Douglas. He said, what? When I got through, when I got through the, with the job, I went in the pursuit of jobbing for a corking. But such was the strength of prejudice against color among the white corkers that they refused to work with me. And of course, I could not get no employment. I am told that color persons cannot get employment at corking New Bedford as a result of what? Anti-slavery efforts. There was no work too hard, none too dirty. dirty. I was ready to saw wood, shovel coal, carry wood, sweep the chimney, roll oil casts off, all of which I did right here in New Bedford. Frederick Douglass. Two are also enslaved Africans, African Americans that called New Bedford their home. John M. Smith and John Thompson. John M. Smith said, I waited, and this was when he was escaping from slavery, 
and on the vessel because New Bedford was also connected to South Carolina, North Carolina, Maryland, all these these ports. So it was some of them were able to escape. And he said, "What? Down, uh, I I made a dash for liberty when the when the ship tied out at the wharf at foot of Union Street, and that Union Street is still standing right now in New Bedford. I was uh, he said, "What? I was over the edge in the midst of an excited crowd, a fugitive, a fugitive." was a cry. I was yet out of, of, of my wits, had little to fear in New Bedford. It's literally this, they stood aside and let me pass. John Thompson, I'm a fugitive, slave from Maryland and have a family in Philadelphia, but fearing to remain there any longer, I thought I would go on a whaling voyage, as being the best place where I stood the least chance of being what? Arrested by slave hunters. And folks, right here in New Bedford, there were slave hunters, was what Congress passed the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act law, which means all runaway slaves had to be captured and returned to their owners. So the North became what? Very dangerous for runaway slave. But right here in New Bedford, they were here and guess what? They were protected. Not a single enslaved lived in New Bedford that were taken back to slavery. And before the Civil War, there were close to 1,000 runaway slaves living in New Bedford. None, zero were taken back to slavery. In Boston, one or two were taken back. In New York, about 300 packed their luggage and took off to Canada. In New Bedford, nobody left. They were safe and they were protected. Because what? The Quakers, the whaling voyage, four to five years. Some of you have read Moby Dick, Henry Mever. This is what the Siemens better that were built in what? In 1832. During whaling, a lot of seamen, right, going four to five years, they come home with what? Money. They may love money. The problem with them is how they spend drinking. Women. And this was something that the Quakers, who were more tolerant in the city could not understand what was going on. So across the Whaling Museum, again, was all the bars, if you have read Game of the Day, the prostitution house, not so good places to kind of visit. And the Crookers built this church right across it. Right? And to them, they were what? Controlling what they call the immorality or the social vices that was going on in New Bedford. And also when they built this, it's also to give the seamen a spiritual connection, right? Before they go on a whaling voyage. So the seamen's Bethel was a Hebrew word, which it was a church by non-denominational church that everybody could come and practice or worship. And this is a place that again, people will come and worship. Again, Moby Dick, Hemet Melville, Wrote about this in uh, there's a whole chapter in, in, in what in members book Moby Dick. And what uh, we, we have something called in a, uh, in the chapel cenotaphs. So if you look across here, there's a, a rectangular shape. These are the names of men. These are the name of men, right? That lost their lives at sea. The family will come and what? Erect, uh, uh, will come and erect those who pass away in this place, and people will come as a memory, right? So this is still again, this is still standing, and those of you who have read again, Moby can come and check it out, and hopefully you can come and join us during the summertime for a walking tour. All right, again, this is what I mean by the cenotaphs. If you look at these two cenotaphs, one is erect in eighteen forty four. And right now, I'm talking to you right now, the fishermen that were lost at sea, the family will come and walk and erect some of this on their R, will come and read their names on, 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 on these other taps. So in one word or a phrase, what are some historical stories from your town, if you don't mind sharing? Anybody? What are some historical stories from your town? Whaling, also all right. <coughs> Eric Canal, Eric Tommy. 
Elizabeth Teba, the Teba families. Grove, Newberry Seaport, Artox. Interesting. And this, uh, this also has some of the stories right here. I saw, I saw Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman was here in New Bedford briefly during the John Brown raid. She came here and she was welcome right here in New Bedford. Thank you. So let's move on. So before we go on, I want to ask this, is there anybody have any question, Robert? Is there any question in the chat that we can uh, talk about? Yeah, so uh, folks, we have about 10 minutes for, uh, at least 10 minutes for questions. If anyone has any uh, questions for Ufai, uh, now is the time. Uh, Joyce asks, how did a whaling captain uh, obtain his wealth? So the whaling, so what, what we have, what, what we call the lay system. So during whaling, there's no such thing as weekly pay or bi-weekly or monthly, right? So people got their money through the lay system. And we have what we call short, short lay and long lay. Short lay are for the whaling merchant, the captains, the mates, first mate, second mate. And we're looking at one eighth, one twelfth, one forty of the profit. The short, the long lay, one hundred, one two hundred and fifty. And these are for the cabin boys, the seamen. So we're talking about, so after a profit of $80,000 is made, right, they take their expenses out, 40,000, then 40,000 is shared about among them. So the captain who makes one eighth of the profit, that's how they make their money. So with time, the more they go on the whaling voyage, the more they go, the more money they make. So how, that's how the captains make uh, their money. Uh, so Scott asks, how did New Bedford deal with the death of the whaling industry? And what is New Bedford known for today? Well, today, not only fishing, today is known for fishing right now. The number one fishing port in the country, because of scallops, right? There's a lot, there's, there's a lot of, lot of regulation going on right now when it comes to fishing. So they have so much per year, right, to go out. So now if you go to the waterfront, a lot of boats not working right now. Manufacturing arts, right? I bet BH Start was here in, in during uh whaling time. Pink Rider. So New Bedford is still known for its artwork. If you come to the National Park on William Street, it's a lot of art studios, galleries, you know. So this is what's going on. Again, restaurants, good food right here, Portuguese food, you know, is fashion, you know. So this is what New Bedford is known for right now. But fishing is number one. Uh, 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 known business in New Bedford right now. What's the best seafood restaurant, uh, Rufai? Uh, we in have New Bedford? The, we have what we call the Black Whale, right at the waterfront, and then the Waterfront Grill also at the waterfront. Uh -huh. So these are the main two seafood restaurant in New Bedford, and each one of them you will not regret it. You know, <laughs> but these are the two main seafood, and the rest of the restaurants they also do have um, other seafood. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Karen asks, are there any intact whaling boats uh, on view in New Bedford? No, there's not. The only one right now, and I mentioned, is in Mystic, Connecticut. That's the only uh, existing wooden ship right now. We have a, a half scale in the whaling museum, right? It's also wooden for people coming and check it out, but it's a half scale whale ship that is inside the whaling museum that, again, you have to pay to go to, to have to pay to go in to go check it out. But at the waterfront, we don't have any wooden. Uh, we do have the schooner and the steamer that just came back. But the schooner and the steamer is not, I want to say it's not a whaling ship. It was like a packet ship that transported Cavadians, you know, to New Bedford back then. Mm -hmm. Shit, you know, so that's what is so that's what we're gonna call maybe I don't know how not a whaling ship, but an old century ship right now in New Bedford right now. But instead of whaling ship, it's only in mystic uh, by Charles, call it Charles W. Morgan. Mm -hmm. uh, an anonymous attendee asks, can you share a bit more about Melville's time in New Bedford? So Melville came to New Bedford around 1840, 1841 when he came to New Bedford. You know, some of them know Melville was born in New York, right? 
His father was wealthy, but his father lost a lot of money through all kinds of business. So when Melvin on his own came to New Bedford, right here, not far from where I'm coming from, that's where he went on his first whaling voyage on the ship called the Akushnet. That's his first whaling ship. So again, 1841, he went almost a year on the whaling ship. That was some, so the whaling voyage was not meant for him. So after one trip, he jumped ship, it's like, you know, I'm done with this, right? And that's why, and also at that same time too, the story of the excess, the ship that was rammed by what? A spam well at the coast of Chile happened. A lot of men, a lot of men lost their lives. There was a lot of cannibalism and cannibalism went on. So they left the men that survived, right? And the was able to connect with them and write their story. So the book, the Marvel book, was due to what the stars were due to the accent and it's also experience on the whaling voyage. So he, so he spent in New Bedford less than a year in New Bedford, but he moved around a lot. You know, so this is a few of his connection uh, uh, um, with the whaling industry. And we do have, I don't want to, I know we have a lot, we, we do have a walking tour, a brochure of him in Melville town right here in New Bedford. So hopefully you can come and join us again, you know, and, you know, I can show you the brochure or you can take your own walk into. But again, New Bedford here gave, uh, uh, well, again, uh, Melville, his storyline, if that makes sense. Michelle asks, how long does the walking tour that you organize uh, take? And is the great Whaleman statue at the library downtown included on that walking tour? Yes. So sometimes, yes, it's right. Some, part of most of our walking tour is, Older people sometimes tend to come on a walking tour, and sometimes we have to accommodate them, right? So the walking tour is running an hour, 45 minutes an hour long, and it's within the historical district. Sometimes we go as far as the Johnson House. So the Johnson House is the, was the first free home of Fort Frederick Douglass, which is still standing right now, right? The statue is, is about three blocks from us not far from the Whaling Museum still standing right now. So sometimes depend also, depend also on the group. So if you want a special walking tour, you can organize a special group, we can go as far as to that location, which would take us like an hour and a half, including the walk and then the program. So it depends, but the walking tour, the regular walking tour is just an hour. But to go, to go a little further, will last an hour and 30 minutes overall. And uh, Rufai, just to confirm, the name of the museum is the New Bedford Whaling Museum. Is that correct? correct? Yeah. Correct. That answers... it's, it's one block from the National Park Service. Yeah. All right. So that answers a couple of questions that uh, popped up. Uh, Esther wants to know, what was the most hunted whale back in the day? The most hunted whale is the, the right whale. The right whale was the most hunted of the whales by the most prized or the one they were looking for is the sperm whale, right? But the most hunted is the right whale. Again, but they what? They swim very slowly, right? You know, and then they are mostly not far from the ocean. So yes, they, uh, they, and then when they got to the Arctic Ocean, the bowhead whale became the most hunted whale in the Arctic Ocean, right? And then the bowhead whale has what? The long, uh, the belly, Right, that separates itself from the other wells, but yeah, so this is by the right well is the most hunted of, of, of all the wells. Uh, Michelle asks, with men off at sea for many years, what role did women play back in New Bedford? There are very actually, there are very interesting stories of women that we, we are, our research is coming up with. There are some women that dress as men to go on a whaling voyage, which we coming out. There are most women, also and mostly the, the wives of captains that go on a whaling voyage. And interestingly now, sometimes the, the captain will fall sick or so, and guess who will take over the, the road? The wife. And we have stories that the women actually navigate some of the, void, the voyages. So it depends on what you look at. The, the most, of the, most of the story we have is mostly the women are the, cap, the wives of the captains. And few here and there, some men or some women dressed as men 
and went on a whaling voyage. There's, a, there's an interesting story in, that happened in New York that ended up in the court system. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't want to pay the young lady, you know, after so long, they eventually paid her, you know. But again, there's so much story about now. New research is digging a lot of story coming up. And so we know few of the women that went on the whaling voyage. Um, Lynn wants to know how long was a typical whaling voyage? So typically it's three to four years. Oh my goodness. I've, I've come across 11 years on the ocean. I've, I've come up, yes, three to four years mostly. But when the, by that time too, the canal was not built. So they have to go all the way down from New Bedford to the Chile, into the Pacific Ocean. Sometimes they will stop at England to sell some of the oil. You know, they have to go to Quebec to pick up men. But they will leave New Bedford half empty of men. They don't have enough men on the whaling voyage. To go to Hawaii, the Honolulu, the Luhai, right? Quebec, uh, the Azores, the coast of Africa. They go all these places and pick up men on their whaling voyage. That also contributed to the, to, to the long um, voyage. You know, and then before they go out whaling. And as you know, sometimes they'll go two, three days without spotting a whale. Mm -hmm. And when they when the whale is hunted almost 24 hours to process it, to take the skin off, to boil it, sperm whale, to scoop the oil from the head, right? To clean the deck. So it takes, you know, and it's a tedious job before they will come back home. And like, as I mentioned, for African Americans, for them, this is like heaven for them compared to slavery, right? So for them, the whaling voyage that even though it was not uh, all that great, God, there was flogging, there was mutton, there was all kind of punishment. It was not compared to slavery. So, so for them, this was a huge three to four years of you know dignity, dignity, opportunity. They became men. They came home and fed their family. Right, they came home and became what they want. Some of them came home having a barber shop, boarding houses right here in New Bedford. Right, so again, about three to four years on a whaling voyage. And then the loss on the ocean was different from the loss on land. That also contributed to a lot of African Americans when they came to New Bedford going on a whaling voyage. And the interesting about this story is before the end of whaling, a lot of them became what? Captains of a whaling ship. Uh, good follow up question for, for Virginia. Uh, how would the community decide if a ship was lost at sea? How long would they wait for a ship? Wow, that's a good question. <laughs> the only ship that we know was lost was the one in the Arctic Ocean. That we know for, we don't have not come across a ship that was lost in the like Pacific Ocean, Atlantic Ocean. I've not come across any research. Uh, but usually what happens is most of, most of the whaling merchants owe maybe three or four, they invest in two or three ships. On a whaling voyage, they stop at, I, I always try to, the, I think the Galacapos Island, right? They drop off mail to switch or exchange, a ship coming back. And that's how they communicate. Lack of, lack of communication, it was very hard back then. So for instance, the excess, when excess was rammed by a ship, nobody knew about it. Nobody knew about it until they made their journey about 3,000 miles to, the, to, to Chile before they were discovered. So your chances of being discovered on the ocean, I don't know, is less. So the, again, the only one we knew about it was the excess. But I've not come across any research that I've mentioned that a ship was uh, discovered, was found, or was stuck. And again, the only one I know is the excess. But that, then the story was sad because if you have read, there's a book called In the Heart of the Sea by Nathaniel Philbrook. I would mm -hmm. recommend you check that book. And that book will tell you more about the excess and how sad the story was. Um. Angela asks, do you happen to know if any whaling ships were built in Wareham, Massachusetts? 
where, yes. where most of the ships. I don't, I don't, uh, yeah, go ahead. What? What? I was just going to ask: Were most of the ships built in New Bedford? Or no, not all, not, not all the ships. Some of them were, were built in Fairhaven. Fairhaven. Some of them were built in Manapoiset. Uh, some of them were built around the port, but majority of majority of them was built in New Bedford. So most of the port and all the cities around New Bedford supported the industry. The, the difference was because of the, the oil refineries, because of the deep harbor in New Bedford. You understand me? So, that was, so most of the ships were built in New Bedford. But most of them, again, the supporting cities built some of the, especially Matapoi set. Mm -hmm. We're gonna take a couple more questions. Uh, oh boy, there's so many to choose from still. Um, I guess uh, we'll go with uh, Lois asks, uh, was the whaling industry's uh, decline, was it abrupt or was it gradual? It was, it was gradual. Mm -hmm. It was gradual because uh, 1859 was when they discovered petroleum in Titusville in uh, Philadelphia, right? So 1859, but still whaling was still going on, mm -hmm. right? And then the gold rush came into the picture. Right, labor shortages <laughs> came to the picture, and then Tesla start coming in. Right, so it eventually uh, all this picture coming on. Eventually, the whaling industry died in 1925 right here in New Bedford. Mm -hmm. The last ship is called the Wanderer. Right, but it was not about. It was just a lot of factors contributing uh, 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 to the end of, and also the wells were literally failed. Mm -hmm. So if petroleum was not discovered, I don't know, probably my generation would not even know what a, what, what a whale is or what will look like. Because mm -hmm. they literally went all the ocean and they were hunting them down. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so a lot of factors contribute to uh, the end of whaling. Joyce asks, uh, were pirates an issue during whaling's heyday? Yes, yes, pirates was, they were, yes. I've not read much about pirates, but I've come across some of my research that mentioned, yes, pirates went in. So yeah. some of the ships, the whaling voyage, some of the ship, they have this white block on the side of the ship to look like a gun, right? To kind of warn pirates in, in, on the ocean. So yes, pirates was something that was not that common. On the whaling uh, on the whaling voyages so final question i'm going to ask is a personal question rufai it comes from an anonymous attendee he or she asks uh coming from ghana how did you become part of the new bed uh, how did you become part of new bedford as a ranger so coming from ghana i came to ghana from ghana at a young age uh after working all jobs i joined the u.s army so I was in the army for four years. I was deployed in Afghanistan for one year. Uh, and when I came back, I was like, okay, maybe every, the whole story about Afghanistan story is a different story. So I ended up getting out of the army and then came to back to home in Fall River. And I went to college at UMass, that's much right here. So I was a college student. And then there was uh, a posting about student intern at the, at, at the national park. And I applied for it. At that time, it was just a job for me. I was just looking for a job to make some living. Uh, and then when I came here, I loved it. I, came, I fell in love with the story, especially, you know, uh, Captain Paul Coffey, Louis Temple, Fergie Douglas. And I also realized that as someone from Ghana, who actually I used to live in a slave castle when I was in Ghana as a child, because my dad was a correction officer, right? And it's a whole story about it. So this was something that eventually uh, uh, got my attention. That's how I got to work for the National Park Service. And when I, when I was down with college in 2014, there was an opening and I applied for it. And as a veteran and who has worked for the park for a few years, uh, I was able to get that job. And that's how I became a park ranger at New Bedford Whaling. So mm -hmm. I do work in chores on the New Bedford way, the Whaling story. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, 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 Underground Railroad, I do start a walking tour. And I know somebody was mentioned about uh, um, the closed caption. I have a strong accent and I apologize for that. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, <laughs> yeah. Rufi, under normal circumstances, the closed caption was pretty horrible. So, yeah, so, so don't yeah. worry about that. Um, so Rufi, you, you yourself have a fascinating life story. And yes. thank, you for your, um, thank you for your service uh, to the military. So folks, let's give Rufi a big virtual round of applause for a wonderful presentation. Uh, folks, uh, look for an email for me later today with a link to this recording, a link to a feedback survey, and information about some other upcoming uh, virtual programs that might be of interest. I know there was about a dozen of you where we didn't get to your questions. Uh, I'll include uh, Rufi's uh, email address uh, in the uh, email that I send out, and uh, feel free to contact him afterwards if you have any questions that weren't answered. And Rufi, let me circle back to you. Uh, you've got a minute or so. Uh, any, any last words for the group uh, before we wrap up? My last word for this group is, again, uh, so first of all, thank you so much for joining us on this uh, uh, virtual program. This is new to me. As you know, that's, that's a new era, virtual program. So hopefully it will get better with time. Also, we are offering our May ending starts our walking tours, right? We're going to start offering walking tours in the historical district. It's an hour walking tour. It's fascinating, different ranges. So hopefully you can join us for a walk in the historical district where you can see the actual area that stuff happened. And hopefully we can make, we can take a walk to Fred Douglas home where that area will become what the abolitionist row park. And it's a statue of Douglas coming up. So again, thank you so much uh, for making time for this program. And hopefully I can see you soon at the park. Great, thank you so much Rufai. Uh, uh, Rufai. Thank you all everyone for joining us. Look for my email later today. I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank yep. you. Nice to meet you. Bye-bye. You too. Bye.